All right, so my seating chart failed because of the furniture rearrangement, so I'll try that again probably next time. But like, there's a sign-in sheet going around uh, in, in place of that. Uh, so today we're going to cover uh, SSRF XXE, uh, a little HTTPS, and then some sensitive data exposure. So um, a lot of acronyms there, uh, so uh, let's get started. So SSRF is the first thing we're going to talk about. Uh, it stands for Server Side Request Forgery. And the idea is that you have some kind of service, some website, and the attacker can give your website a payload that forces you to make an HTTP request on its behalf. So um, this is considered, so the reason why I'm covering it now is because we just covered local file include, where you're, you're trying to include rogue content on the server within the output of some script running, so that PHP include. Uh, this is considered remote file include, where instead of a local file that you include into the output, you're trying to get the, the server to retrieve a URL and include that. And so you're like, well, that doesn't seem like an exploit at all. Uh, we'll get to how this can be weaponized. Um, and in fact, this is actually a feature in a lot of things, like web proxies, right? That's what you want a web proxy to do. You're like, here's a URL, get it for me. Uh, another uh, intended, uh, well, uh, another feature is for web application firewalls. So if you're filtering traffic, like so say uh, Portland State is filtering all of the web traffic that's going out to the internet, making sure to filter out any rogue connections. So if the people are trying to attack the internet from their local networks, they'll do a firewall that tries to look at the requests, maybe retrieve some of the content to see what the results are, and then either allow or deny that request. So it turns out these web application firewalls are in a lot of places, uh, and that's one of the things that they do. That's built in. That's what. They have to do that in order to function uh, the way they're supposed to. Uh, and so uh, some example of uh, uh, what you might see in code. Uh, in PHP, we saw that include call allowed you to locally include a file. Uh, if you, if you uh, injected a URL into that include directive, you can actually get PHP to go out and get the, the web content that you have associated there. Um, but of course, being PHP, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. PHP has got this configuration, php.ini, that says whether or not you allow that. So when you are configuring PHP and you really don't want to allow this kind of behavior, then you have to set the directive, uh, just as an aside. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Uh, a, an attacker notices that you have some server that uh, has this SSRF vulnerability or feature, uh, uh, asks your server to fetch uh, google.com, so your example.com, says fetch google.com, and so you see there's a URL parameter that says this is what I want you to get. Example.com goes and fetches it for you, gets the response, and then uh, delivers that back to you. So that actually seems pretty innocuous uh, when you look at it. Uh, but here's the problem, uh, the target doesn't have to be google.com. Everybody knows what google.com looks like. But if you're running, say, on your home network, you have a web server that's got uh, this vulnerability in it, and you have a whole bunch of sensitive servers that you have given I private IP addresses to because they're sensitive servers, and you don't want anybody to access those sensitive servers, if they happen to be running web servers, then what you can do is you can uh, send the vulnerable server a URL that hits this internal, the internal private servers, okay? Um, and so uh, this is the scenario. So say you have the vulnerable front-end server, so like web for pen tester. You know, that's got a vulnerable, uh, that's got a remote file include vulnerability in it. One of the levels does. Uh, and then you pop up a virtual machine in your cloud project that you only give a, a private IP address to and that has your cloud secrets in it, right? All of your cloud secrets, you're like, oh, I'm not gonna give it an external IP address because I don't want anyone to access it, but yet you have co-located that thing next to Web for Pentester. 
well then they can submit something to web for pen tester to turn around and, and issue a request to your private uh, uh, server uh, that you didn't want to have access. Okay, and so there will be a level uh, in your labs that does exactly this, where you, you can scan, in fact, you can scan the entire internal network of an organization uh, for, if they have a web proxy that you can access then, and that has this vulnerability, then you can sit there and you can scan for all of the internal websites that they might have running. And these internal websites might have been protected against external access, because, but because you're accessing it from sort of internally, it'll be allowed. Okay, so this was actually one uh, the source of the Capital One breach uh, over the summer. Uh, it was an SSRF vulnerability that allowed the adversary to pivot over and get some internal resources. Now, what those internal resources are going, what the internal resources were, we're going to talk about when we get to the cloud security uh, part of it. But the initial vulnerability was a web proxy. No, it was a web application firewall that was proxying requests, and the adversary proxied a request to an internal server that had a bunch of stuff that uh, allowed uh, this person access. Okay, uh, so SSRF, so when, when 2017 uh, was around, SSRF wasn't a big thing. I can almost guarantee SSRF is in the top 10 the next time they do this list. If not, something, something bad would have happened politically in, in OWASP. Um, but yeah, I got dollars to donuts, it's on there next time. Okay, so uh, there are some really good GitHubs that have uh, all the different kinds of SSRF payloads. You want, like as soon as you find one of these things, you would just run all these payloads through there to see if anything is accessible that shouldn't be. So this is payloads all the things, uh, sort of a play off of own all the things. Uh, and so one of the things, I, this is the, um, no, that's not the URL you're going to use. But these are the kinds of things that you can do with an SSRF. So, for example, this one is going to probe whether your web server has port 22 open because it's localhost. And it's proxying that connection and then hitting your, uh, hitting a local uh, server. Uh, you could do this on all the different ports, right? <laughs> What are all the different ports that have services running on all of the internal IP addresses? And then you would get basically a port scan uh, done for you uh, in this manner. Uh, the two things we're going to cover in the cloud piece are the metadata services for AWS and Google Cloud. Turns out the metadata one for AWS is what the Capital One breach uh, hit. Okay. Uh, so you'll be doing that in your labs, uh, your first set of labs. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, which did make the OWASP top 10, is this XML external entities uh, vulnerability. And this stuff is really old school. And because we have a whole bunch of old school server stuff out there, this is the reason this is in the top 10. Um, so if you uh, get hired by a company with a lot of legacy uh, Java <laughs> uh, and Java server pages, you might run into this uh, vulnerability. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is XML. Uh, this is a generalized format that preceded, uh, preceded JSON, uh, and it was being used to build web applications. So before REST APIs and JSON were on the scene, we had SOAP and XML. That was the, the equivalent. Uh, and SOAP is this simple object access protocol, uh, and then you would pass back XML back and forth using this protocol to build your web application, okay? So um, there are two parts to XML uh, that we're, we're not going to talk about the protocol itself. It's just an inter uh, interchange protocol. We're going to talk about XML, and XML has two things. It has a document type definition uh, piece that allows you to define the structure and the elements of whatever document you're about to send. Uh, so XML is this generic document format where you say, hey, it's sort of like, here's the specification of what I'm going to send you, and then you, get the, you, you send the document that meets that specification. So that's the second part, the document. You, the document definition is first, and then you send the document uh, along with it. Um, and so the, the issue is, is that XML is allowing you, in some cases, allowing the user to define what the uh, DTD is. 
So as soon as you allow the user to define the document type and the elements within that document type, you have potential for abuse. Okay, uh, and so uh, I'm going to show you examples. Um, so one of the things with XML and in the DTD is this idea of an entity. So the entity is some user-defined piece of uh, a variable almost that you can say, you know, instead of this variable, I want you to instead substitute something else. Um, it's sort of like a variable in a, in, in a program. Uh, so for, uh, um, I'll just show you the example. So one of the things you can do is you can define in an, a DTD a, an entity that points to some internal variable that you've defined. So here's an example of a, an ent so at, at the top you have this doc type. So the way we define the DTD is to say with these special tags, so this is my version of XML, and the first thing that happens in this XML file is declaring your DTD. So in this case, I have a very simple DTD, and this doc type is, is called foo, and within this doc type, I want to make a slight uh, customization to my document type that says this entity called copyright statement, anytime you see copyright statement as an entity in my document attached below, I want you to substitute for, for this copyright statement this warning uh, uh, text, and then this will be the end of my document type. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to define my document, this XML message, and then within here I can instantiate this entity with the copyright statement. And what this does is that this goes to the XML parser. The XML is like, hey, I have to actually render this document. And so what the XML parser is going to do, it's going to expand out the copyright statement and then generate this. Is that pretty clear what the document, uh, the type definition followed by the document, and then that, that basically the parser will then generate this for you. Okay. Uh, and so uh, this is one of the initial exploits against uh, XML that's uh, a good laugh. Uh, so you can specify entities as uh, sort of derived from other entities in XML. And so you could do something like this. You can specify an entity laugh zero as this string, and then you can specify laugh one as two of these things. And then uh, what you, when you instantiate in your XML uh, laugh one, you end up doing uh, two of these, right? Okay. So back in the 90s, uh, this thing started getting passed around. So uh, if you have some uh, SOAP web server that's parsing XML and you send it this, what do you think this is going to do? Expand. How many, how many, of, how many of these uh, uh, LOLs do you think this is going to generate? A big number. So there are 10 of these. If you count, a, yeah, 10 to, yeah, OK. So basically, this was the decompression bomb. This is the billion laughs attack. So you can, if, if this was being sent around, you basically have a denial of service vector, okay? So this is no, no longer possible, but this is, this is part of the problem of, allowing, of not considering adversarial input when you talk about a document format. And so this is not necessarily code in, injection in this case, but you are giving the adversarial language for doing something like uh, a decompression bomb, okay? Um, the vulnerability is uh, when we refer to things that are called external entities. So this is called an internal entity because the element that you define uh, up there, the entity that you define here is internally defined as this string LOL. So what an external entity is, is that that reference can come from the file system or elsewhere. So in this case, rather than giving you the text for the copyright statement, I want to indirectly point you into the server's local file system and say uh, that, that uh, entity is defined in this text file. And then the server will pull it out, okay? And you'll get the same thing. Does that make sense? Um, 
What does this remind you of? Like a lab that you might have just done? The local file include. That's what that is. And that's why I'm covering it right after you just did the local file. This is just another local file include. Okay. Um, and so uh, you could do something like this. Uh, uh, you could define in your XML, you could say, hey, you know what? I want you to include uh, Etsy password in, in my document format. Uh, and then if that, if that server actually compiles that XML document and parses it and instantiates it, then the contents of Etsy password are included. <laughs> Okay. Uh, it could also be used uh, that the entity that you define could also specify a URL. Uh, and then this is a remote file include as well. So you can include an SSRF inside of an XXE, which is why I'm covering them together because they're sort of kind of used together uh, a lot of the times. So here's an example. I have an admin interface on a private IP address and I think nobody else can access it, and then this thing is gonna, the XML parser is gonna do me in. And who would have thought that? I would have never have checked an XML parser uh, to, to, to lose all the security in my backend network, but yet it, yet it caused that. Okay, so uh, here is, this is a figure from the, uh, the port swigger labs that you'll be doing. Uh, so if I send this XML file, let's say this is my document type, it's a stock check entity, and uh, I'm going to say, instead of actually getting me the stock on an item, I'm going to say, give me Etsy password. And then uh, I emit this as a result. Then I'll get, as, I'll get passed back Etsy password. Okay? So that's one of, your, uh, one of your levels. Here's another one. So uh, as I had before, you can probe for server, the, all of the private servers, uh, or the private network that, your, that that server is uh, hosted on, the XML parser is hosted on, you can actually scan the backend servers using uh, what we had just talked about earlier um, with a sequence of URLs. And this is basically an SSRF with an XXE. There will be a lab in your SSRF labs where you're going to be scanning sequentially a list of IP addresses on the backend. I've got a Python script there in the, included in the uh, lab write-ups. I would suggest you use that. You could use some of the sequencing things in either burp, I don't even know if Postman will do the sequencing for you, but to do that, I would, I would recommend the Python script. Um, and then scenario three, this is a den denial of service attack. I want you, I wanted this, the parser to uh, get me this file, and if you know anything about dev random, it is an infinite stream of random data, of pseudo random data, and so that'll basically cause a denial of service attack against your, your parser, okay? Okay, so uh, if you are, <laughs> if you're uh, in web development and you're looking for places where parsers get called, here are a couple of patterns where whenever you see any of these loads or any of these parse statements, you want to make sure that those things aren't taking unsanitized user input and sending it straight to the parser. So you would have to do some input validation on that thing or ensure that the input that it's getting is internally generated, not from some URL web parameter that the adversary can control. Okay, so there is some remediations. Most parsers now have a stack limit so that uh, mil the billion last thing uh, shouldn't work on anything right now. Um, and then uh, there are libraries for strongly validating the input. Uh, the other thing that you would want to do is why have the user supply a DTD at all, right? Like, just get that out. Like, any sort of doc type definitions you can strip out before, well, if you can, if your application doesn't need the user to define these things, then you would just strip them out uh, and, and, and get rid of them. Okay, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about is sensitive data exposure. This is A6. Uh, but before I talk about sensitive data exposure, I ha I'm going to have to talk about uh, encryption, TLS, and HTTPS, because that is key. Uh, having a HTTPS enabled is essential for you to hide your sensitive data, at least in flight. And so I'm not going to assume any of you know HTTPS or TLS, uh, because, yeah, I don't have that as a prerequisite. 
Some of you have seen this in my other courses, but I'm just going to give you a crash course on how TLS works and how it applies when we're, when we're doing HTTPS. Okay? Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is that initially, HTTP, TCP, and IP had no security built in. So it's much like your homework site. There's no security built in there. This is why I told you not to use any password that you need, uh, because all that stuff's in the clear. If I'm sitting there monitoring the, the network, I can pull out the, well, if it's an open uh, network, I can sit there and pull out all of your credentials as it goes across the wire. So there was no support for secrecy. Uh, there was also no support for server authentication. If I could somehow get in the middle between you and CS495 Oregon CTF, I could actually inject my own, as an adversary, inject my own data into your HTTP connection. Um, I could uh, impersonate uh, the, the server you're trying to hit. Uh, I could also tamper with the messages. So there was no message integrity associated with your, your session uh, to my server. So in 1994, uh, Netscape uh, uh, sort of developed SSL, which is called Secure Sockets Layer, and uh, that provided a layer of protection uh, for web connections. And this is where HTTPS first uh, started being used. Uh, now it's morphed into TLS, which is called Transport Layer Security, and this is the thing that gives you the green lock. Uh, so we're going to talk about how all of this stuff works because it's, in, it's essential that you understand how to configure HTTPS uh, if you're trying to lock down your, your websites and your web servers and to know what these things uh, do. Okay, so initially the adoption was really slow. Only the companies that had a lot of money uh, were sort of deploying this uh, because it's an expensive protocol uh, compared to, to, to doing things in the clear. Uh, and there was, there was little incentive to actually get this thing deployed. Um, they also had an issue where it was hard to get vouched for. In order to get an HTTPS certificate, somebody with an authority has to actually sign a certificate for you. And that ended up precluding a lot of people from, uh, from doing this as well. Okay. But it is now ubiquitous. So uh, we have seen Intel's got like hardware support for doing a lot of these operations. Uh, so uh, x86 instructions for, for AES, which is one of the ciphers that is being used in HTTPS. It's got dedicated ASICs for, on servers, you have dedicated ASICs for doing the certificate validations and, and the handshakes. Um, it's ubiquitous uh, because now there's an incentive uh, to do HTTPS because uh, what Snowden revealed and one of the things he revealed was uh, that security intelligence agencies were actually trying to hijack HTTPS connections, or HTTP connections. Uh, and so this ended up, uh, the last thing that, that, that now is causing this to be ubiquitous is that as a result of the revelations, uh, they developed this thing called Let's Encrypt that gives everyone the ability to get free TLS certificates. Uh, and so this is why we're going to cover it here. Um, in order for me to explain how the protocol works, I'm going to give you just a, a crash course on the cryptography associated with it. Uh, I'm assuming you, you haven't had 485 and 585, but if you are interested in the details of what I'm going to talk about here, you, would, you should take that course. Um, so the first thing is uh, encryption algorithms. Um, the first thing is in, uh, symmetric encryption. So with symmetric encryption schemes, there are three main algorithms associated with symmetric encryption. Um, there is a key generation algorithm, which uh, uh, creates a secret key for use between the two endpoints. There is an encryption function where you take your key that you generated in the previous step, you apply it to a plain text message, and you get ciphertext. And then there is a decryption which goes the other way. It takes the exact same key, and this is why it's called symmetric, because the two key values are the same. And you say decrypt with that key the ciphertext, and you get the plain text back. Okay, so the same key is used to encrypt and decrypt, which is what the symmetric term uh, stands for. Um, and some examples of this are block ciphers, uh, AES. Uh, there are some stream ciphers that use this as well. Um, and the features of symmetric encryption are that it's really fast, it's easy to accelerate, and it's good for a large amount of data. 
Um, uh, the biggest issue with symmetric encryption is this K. Like, how do you get that key to the person that you're trying to communicate with without it being hijacked and without people seeing that key? So it's got this bootstrapping problem, this distribution problem. Um, asymmetric encryption tries to address the key distribution problem. So with asymmetric encryption, you have public key, a public key and a private key pair. They're generated together. And there's magic associated with this pair. Um, uh, it has three different algorithms as well, the generation, the encryption, and the decryption. Um, but it also has a fourth thing that we're going to talk about, which is our digital signatures and their verification. So we'll need that when we're, when we're using HTTPS. OK. So um, it uses different keys to both encrypt and decrypt. And this is why it's called asymmetric. Uh, anyone can encrypt a message if they're given a, 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 a key but a public key, but only the private key of that particular user uh, can decrypt the message. Okay, so there's two keys. I have a public key, I give it to everybody, and then they encrypt with that public key, and because I'm the only one with the private key, I'm the only one who can decrypt it. Okay, uh, the issue with asymmetric encryption in this particular operation is that it's slow. Uh, it's slow, it's hard to accelerate, these are expensive operations, and it's only good for a small amount of data, not for the massive amounts of data like YouTube is pushing through, uh, for example. Um, but this is really easy for you to distribute your keys, right? Because I have a public key, and by nature it's public, right? I'm supposed to uh, broadcast it everywhere. Whereas in the symmetric example, I, that key has to be secret, because as soon as anyone sees it, my whole scheme is broken. OK. So I'm going to show you a figure of, of how these things work. Uh, the blue is the public key. The red is this, the private key. Uh, this notebook, this notepad is uh, plain text. And then scrambled characters uh, on the paper is ciphertext. Uh, so for asymmetric encryption, uh, the idea is that Bob uses a key generation algorithm to generate the two, uh, the, the key pair. So that's Bob's public key and private key in blue and red. And then uh, Bob will then broadcast the public key everywhere. And Alice gets a copy of this public key. And then uh, when Alice wants to send Bob a private message, takes the public key, takes the plain text that she wants to send, mashes them together in the encryption function, generates the ciphertext, sends the ciphertext to Bob, and then Bob takes the ciphertext, and because he, he is the only one with this private key, he's the only one who can then generate the plain text. So this immediately gives you secrecy in the, in the message. OK, uh, public key, private key pairs can also be used to support digital signatures. Uh, digital signatures and verification of those signatures. So there are two algorithms, generate a signature, and then the, the other one is verify that a particular public key has signed a message, so the verification piece. So there's two, two things there. And this, so the first thing gave you secrecy. This thing is going to give you what's known as non-repudiation. Uh, I have now proof that a particular, uh, a particular pub, uh, key was used to sign a message. So that's, uh, we're going to need both when it comes to HTTPS, uh, but uh, this is why we're talking about these two sets of things. So in this case, Bob has a message that says, uh, so Alice is a bank, uh, and uh, Bob says, hey, you know, I, I have, and Bob has an account on, uh, in Alice's bank. Uh, Bob sends a message to Alice that, hey, I want to withdraw $1 from the bank. And, uh, uh, Alice wants to make sure it, it was actually Bob who issued that request, right? And so as we have before, um, we have the public key, private key pair. And this is the same pair that we had in the previous one. Bob takes this text message that says, withdraw a dollar, signs it with his private key, right? Generates the, the message and then with this signature which is part which is generated by this private key, sends that to Alice. Uh, so Alice has the original message and a signature that is generated from this uh, private key. Uh, and then because Alice has the public key, 
This is the verification part of the, the algorithm where you can, with Bob's public key, verify that this, his associated private key signed this document so that you can say, yes, I have non-repudiation on Bob wanting to withdraw a dollar. And then uh, Alice debits uh, Bob's account a dollar and then sends him that dollar. Okay. Is this clear? So these two abstractions should be clear because this is how we're going to explain HTTPS. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so um, th when I uh, showed you this, that Bob is signing, signing an entire message, typically if this message is really large, uh, he wouldn't want to sign a large, because this is an expensive operation, the signing is. Uh, so instead, what Bob would actually do is sign a hash of the message. So in this case, there's the original document that he wants to send, this data file. What he does is he, he creates a cryptographic hash of this file, and then what he does is he uses his private key to sign the hash. And this gives him the digital signature here. And the, what he does is he attaches this digital signature with the original data file and then sends that to the other side. On the other side, to verify this signature, uh, the recipient will take that data file uh, shown here and then regenerate the exact same hash so it could be um, SHA-256, for example, and then that's the hash that is generated. And then the recipient will take the signature in green, and then using the public key of the sender, uh, verify that this signature and this public key uh, match the hash that it got from this document. Okay? And then that's the check to, to say whether or not this was uh, legitimately sent. Um, so typically, what you would have in most modern security protocols is that the asymmetric and the symmetric algorithms are used together, especially if you're sending a large amount of data. Okay, so the idea here is that because the asymmetric encryption operations are expensive, you would use that to bootstrap a symmetric scheme that was more, that's more efficient. Okay. So asymmetric has the expensive uh, uh, the issue of expense. Symmetric has the issue of key distribution. Um, and so the idea of most protocols is to combine these things. Uh, you use the asymmetric algorithm to uh, establish the symmetric keys of your session. And then you would use symmetric encryption for the large scale data transfer. Okay, so this is an, uh, an idealized picture of how PGP works, uh, which is uh, this practical, so in, in practice, this is one of the schemes that takes this approach. Uh, so the goal is, in this case, send a large message M to Bob, and Bob has this public key as before. Uh, generates a random symmetric key, K, um, and then encrypts this message with that key. So again, symmetric encryption is cheap, so I you know, generate a random key, encrypt my message with that random key, and now I need to get that key over to the recipient. Okay? And so what I'll do, uh, so after I do the encryption of, of, of the message, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that key, and I'm gonna, because the key is a small, a small value, I'm going to encrypt that key with the, the public key of Bob, because I'm sending it to Bob. Okay? And in this way, only Bob can decrypt what that key is. Okay. And I generate, in this case, this ciphertext of that key. So this is the ciphertext of the message generated from the uh, symmetric key. And this is the ciphertext of the, uh, the key generated from Bob's public key. And then I send both of these things over to Bob. Bob will first take the uh, C sub K, use his private key, to generate the symmetric key that was used, and then use that symmetric key to decrypt the message. So that's what PGP does. Questions about how this, this thing operates? Did I lose everyone, or is this clear, actually? I see some nods, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, clear. All right. Good. I'm going. I'm going to go through. <laughs> Um, so the question then becomes is how do you securely obtain someone's public key? So I said the key distribution problem has been quote unquote solved, but Bob's public key. Like if Bob says this is my public key and another Bob says no, this is, this is Bob's public key, how do you uh, remediate that is, is the question. Uh, so as it turns out with PGP, you do it by face-to-face -face interactions. You bootstrap your trust based on a face-to-face -face interaction with someone where you can exchange a, a public key, uh, the public key. So uh, back in the day when PGP was, was being used a lot, there was this PGP fingerprint, and this is effectively your, your public key. Uh, there were some business cards where they would give you the public key as a QR code, and then I would have to have physical copies of my business card for you to, to get in order for you to bootstrap the trust for me to have authentic, secure communications with you. Uh, the problem with this is that it's a point-to-point -point web of trust, right? Um, this does not work for web transactions. I am not going to be able to go up to Sergey Brin and say, hey, what's, your, what's Google's uh, you know, public key so I can you know, go onto your site securely? So you need something else. You need to be able to distribute the public key of the server appropriately. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about next when we talk about HTTPS and certificate authorities. Uh, so the problem here is that you have Alice uh, as the client on the left, uh, has a web browser, and uh, Alice is trying to hit bob.com uh, over here. And Bob has a private key and a public key. And uh, what you want to do is Alice wants to obtain an authentic copy of Bob's public key. Now here's the problem. Bob.com can get hijacked, right? Anybody can, for example, you know, DNS is horribly insecure. Uh, somebody on this network can monitor the network, see that you're looking for the uh, Bob.com DNS entry, and then say, oh, here, I'm Bob.com, you know, immediately, because you're on the same network. You can immediately reply, Bob.com is 192.168.0.1, okay? So HTTPS is looking to solve that problem. How is it that uh, uh, people are prevented from impersonating Bob.com? OK. So it does th this through a trusted third party. And this trusted third party is called the certificate authority. Uh, and so what happens is all of the software used for web interactions uh, have built in to their software distribution the public key of a whole bunch of certificate authorities. And so these certificate authorities have their private keys, and then they publish their public key to Nginx, to Apache, to Firefox, and to Chrome. And so this is the bootstrap mechanism where a relationship between the certificate authority and all the producers of web software has been made. And then the public key has been given to them and shipped in all of the browsers and the web servers. Okay. Then uh, if Bob wants to get a certificate authority to vouch for him, what he does is he sends in this request saying, this is the public key I want associated with Bob.com. And uh, I am going to give you this public key plus some proof that I am Bob.com. Now, in the old days, you actually had to physically verify this. Like the certificate authority would come and visit you or establish a physical one-on-one -on -one relationship with you and say, OK, yeah, this company is legit. I'm going to use my private key to sign your web certificate. And this is why it costs like hundreds of dollars a year for you to get your, uh, your certificate, your, your, your public key as part of a signed certificate by the CA. Um, what Let's Encrypt does, it says, do you, at the time of issuance, own the DNS record and the IP address for Bob.com? So this is, the, this is the optimization that Let's Encrypt does in order to allow everyone to be able to get signed certificates from the certificate authority very easily. So the proof that you send is your public key 
And then when it does a DNS lookup and hits you with a request, because you now own that DNS address and IP address, you can put some secrets in there that the certificate authority can verify, and then that will trigger the certificate authority to sign your certificate. And what you get back is this cert that's, that is signed by the certificate authority that says bob.com is this public key. Okay. So then what happens is that Alice is going to go and go to HTTPS uh, slash uh, bob.com. And uh, what Bob is going to send back to Alice is exactly this cert. So bob.com's key is this public key. Uh, Bob, and then I have the certificate authority signature, and because Alice has this public key of that certificate authority, uh, this Alice now knows that Bob has done this authentication, and is a legitimate, is the legitimate public key for Bob.com. So this is how HTTPS works. Are is there questions about the protocol, like functionally how it works? So when you run, so the software package is called CertBot for Let's Encrypt. When you run CertBot, it actually pops up a server with some secrets in the uh, sort of the file system. And then, uh, so CertBot will communicate with, with, with Let's Encrypt servers. And the idea is that the Let's Encrypt servers are going to look up bob.com, go to that IP address, and look for those secrets to be in that, those pre-established secrets to be in that in that server. And so that, because you are running CertBot and you've got the DNS name pointing to the same IP address that you're running the CertBot on, it will issue that. Uh, and, and of course, the thing that you're asking for has to be, has to match. And then, the, and that's how you verify uh, for Let's Encrypt. Yeah. Now it's important that this is just Let's Encrypt. There are other ways of verifying certs. Uh, in fact, uh, you can actually poke around in the certificates to see the kind of verification that's been done. There's this thing called extended verification for HTTPS certificates that, that actually give you a little bit more, like, like if you really were like, yeah, I want the brick and mortar sort of uh, validation, like because anybody could hijack. So someone could temporarily hijack by bob.com, go to Let's Encrypt and say, yeah, I'm bob.com. As long as you can trick uh, the Let's Encrypt server, like you can you can hijack the DNS request from the Let's Encrypt server to to try and uh, get a a certificate on Bob's behalf that when you're not Bob.com, so that that does happen. And there are actually attacks against uh, domain registrars where people are trying to get the accounts of the admins who are managing the DNS records so that they can go there and get these certificates out of them or issued from them. Okay. So um, I'm now going to talk about what happens when Alice goes and uh, uh, communicates with Bob.com. So this is the other piece of the protocol. Uh, so when uh, the connection to Bob.com is made, uh, uh, after the TCP handshake, you'll end up doing this SSL TLS handshake. Uh, so it starts out with a client hello, and then the server will pass to Alice the certificate. And as part of the certificate, it will also pass back the different cipher suites that it has available to it to do the symmetric key encryption subsequently. So I said earlier, you're going to use a public key to establish a symmetric key. And then you're going to use the symmetric key to do the encryption. The cipher suites tell, allow Bob to say to Alice, this is what I support. AES, hopefully. Uh, one of the better AESs, hopefully. Uh, and then some random data uh, that uh, is going to be used for key generation. Uh, and then what happens here is that Alice will, based on the public key of the certificate authority in her browser, will extract the, uh, will verify the signature and then extract the public key of Bob. And then what it's going to do is because the public key has now been uh, obtained, she's going to then generate this master secret. So this is the symmetric, you can think of this as the symmetric encryption uh, piece. 
So now I have to, I'm using the public key thing to bootstrap the transmission of a secret key, which is the, uh, which is the next thing. So uh, has a master secret encrypted with the public key of Bob. Okay, so the next step on the server is to then decrypt the master secret that the client has sent with your private key. So this is the first part of the uh, public key, private key operation where you're just decrypting the encrypted payload. Uh, and this is, the, this is the slow, expensive operation on the server, uh, which is why um, for a while people weren't deploying this because this is actually server, this is potentially a denial of service vector if you bog the server down with a whole bunch of these things. Um, that's the idea. Uh, and then you can finish this exchange and then you have bootstrapped a, a secret uh, uh, symmetric key that you can then do the rest of the communication over. Okay, and this is HTTPS underneath. Okay. Um, so the, the result is the thing you see up here when you hit a secure site, although you don't see the green thing anymore. I think it's gray, at least for me it's gray. The UI is always changing. You should always see a lock, and the lock means that it's, it's a TLS connection uh, going on underneath. Okay, so one issue is that now I have HTTPS and I have HTTP. How do I make sure that the users are going to HTTPS if I have it? Uh, and so earlier I showed you the redirect. When you go to a site that's got both and that site wants you to use the secure version, then the 301 redirect, uh, the way that works is if I issue this status code 301 that says moved permanently, uh, as part of the location header, in HTTP, uh, the response, it will redirect you to the site that you're supposed to go to. Um, but here's a problem. What happens if I've hijacked this initial HTTP request? Like say I have hijacked the DNS for Oregon CTF temporarily, and I say, okay, um, I want to redirect you to this thing. And if you look at this URL, this is actually a zero, not an O. Uh, what happens here? What happens, what do you think happens here? Yes. Yeah, this is phishing. This is what you can do. So, so this is what motivates this header called HTTP strict transport security. Okay. Um, so the initial problem is this first request. If I have users always going to the regular HTTP, not only is it a latency problem, because you're always doing this. You're saying, give me the regular thing, and it's redirecting you, redirecting you to the HTTPS version. So you got multiple round trips just to get to this thing. Uh, but the other thing is that you are vulnerable, because this is in the clear, you are vulnerable to a hijacking attack, which would lead to a, a phishing. Because all the adversary really needs to do, because nobody owns this site, all the adversary needs to do is to register this DNS name and then issue a certificate on it and then you would get something that looks very similar uh, to the UI above. Okay, so the strict transport security header, it's a response header uh, that tells the client to force usage of HTTPS for a particular domain, okay? So on the initial access, the first time you ever go to Oregon CTF, what I can do is I can say, you know, from now on, this particular browser, I want to tell this browser to always use HTTPS whenever it goes to Oregon CTF. And that's what the semantic of this header is, okay? And this is what it looks like. So if you go to facebook.com, it says uh, strict transport security, and it gives you a, there's an age. So the thing times out uh, so that if, if Facebook's wants to, Facebook wants to change the policy, uh, it can wait that amount of seconds, which is a lot, and then it can time out the policy. Um, and I'll talk about what preload means in a second. But now, if a client goes to an open Wi-Fi, so the client has visited Facebook, has been given this header, if the client now goes to an open Wi-Fi uh, uh, hotspot, if they click on H the HTTP link for Facebook, the client will automatically go, oh no, you need HTTPS because I got this header in the past. And so that initial connection to go to the regular HTTP server is no longer made. 
even if you click on a, a, a on it in a browser. The client will now uh, uh, go straight to the HTTPS. And this avoids this man-in-the-middle attack uh, where you can redirect the thing to uh, somewhere else. OK, um, so then you still have that initial request, right? The very first time you hit OregonCTF or Google.com, you are going there, and then you're going to get this header set to you. Uh, and so what you want to do is remove that thing in the first place. And the way to remove that thing is that every browser has this thing called the HSTS preload list. So this is strict transport security preload list. So the browser comes pre-configured with a list of sites that must always go to HTTPS. And you can add yourself to that list. If you're a site that only does HTTPS, you can add yourself to that list by clicking that link. Uh, preload.org, submit your, there are some requirements you have to meet before you're added to the list. But then every single browser that supports this preload list, whenever they get a clear uh, HTTP request for that destination, it'll automatically go to the HTTPS version. Okay. Uh, this is how you would configure it in uh, an Apache or Nginx. Uh, you just always set strict transport security, and then you give it the, the timeout that you want. This is Apache. Uh, this is Nginx, the server block. You can specify the header and just add a header. This is the standard way of specifying server headers in Nginx, and that's how you would configure your site to, to support strict uh, transport security. Okay, uh, questions about this? OK, so uh, revisiting this, uh, can you prevent this at all uh, is the question. So I have Oregon CTF, and I, this is basically a typo squat with the, with the secure padlock, even though that has nothing to do with me. Um, so the answer is no. Um, we have an issue with HTTPS, is, uh, and the issue is, is that we have conflated the UI for HTTPS to mean both security in terms of encryption and identity. Uh, so, a generation of internet users will look at this green thing and say, that's legitimate. Uh, and so, uh, most Americans don't have a clue what HTTPS means. They did this multiple choice quiz, and they surveyed a bunch of people, and they were like, what does HTTPS, what is the semantics of HTTPS? And they are like, you know, a bunch of different choices, and it turns out the results of this, 30% uh, know that it only means encryption. Uh, only really means uh, the thing is secure. 12% uh, think it's actually, it actually means as verified as trustworthy. So this is a problem because now you know what the verification actually is, and it ain't that. Uh, I know, I've got a lot of HTTPS stuff, so. <laughs> um, so this is, this is not a guarantee that anything has been validated as being trustworthy. Okay, and so now you see in the last year or two that uh, Let's Encrypt is being used heavily by adversaries. These are, there's there a statistic, I, I listened to the Risky Business podcast, and some statistic of like 80 or 90% of all uh, Let's Encrypt certificates are sent to what they suspect are phishing domains. Um, so that's a huge percent, and this is uh, over the summer. This is um, uh, the public service announcement from the FBI saying that uh, cyber actors are going with secure websites big time, um, and so they're they're almost always incorporating these website certificates, especially after uh, Chrome started labeling the plain text uh, or the, the the in the clear HTTP as insecure. Now all of the 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 malicious sites uh, are doing uh, certificates. Okay. Uh, and then you see this is uh, Q1's 29, so the earlier uh, last year, uh, quarter over quarter, there was like a 26% increase in the use of malicious URLs that had HTTPS uh, turned on. Okay, so here's a more recent example. Um, this was really well designed where uh, they redirected uh, people to this payment domain that looked pretty darn, I mean, 
they were saying this is actually this looks more legitimate than the actual payment site uh, because this was done using a modern uh, web framework and a lot of the older payment sites they're using really old school like JSP and oh, I don't want to I don't want to dig on a particular technology but they were saying the technology being used in some of these payment sites haven't been updated in years uh, but the adversaries they're learning React and Angular just like the rest of us and then they're actually giving you the better site. So this is a big problem because if you look at the URL, payment-mastercard.com, I could almost believe that that's legit. Uh, that, because I have, I've also seen really awful URL domain names for legitimate sites. So now we have a problem. We have a real UI problem. Uh, and it's hitting CS people as well as, as, as lay people out there. Um, OK, here's another issue. And this is related to issue number one. Um, uh, we're having a hard time with the UI discerning what is legitimate and what is not. So here's an example I use. This is an old example, but how can you tell as a user whether this is two windows or one, right? Like I can show you an image uh, or I can have an iframe that's got elements that look exactly like a legitimate browser session, but it's actually not. It's like a frame that doesn't have any of the functionality of the browser within it. Okay, so that's a problem. Um, and these visual cues, the adversary is totally trying to leverage in order to get random clicks through there. So we'll talk about this again when we talk about clickjacking. Uh, clickjacking is also called UI redressing. It's a fancier name. Um, but that's a problem. Uh, another problem is uh, any, uh, any certificate authority can generate a valid certificate for any website. So your browser, I only showed one browser with one uh, certificate authority key, but you could have uh, thousands of uh, CA keys in your browser. Uh, and then the problem is, is can we trust all of those certificate authorities to do what we're asking them to do? Uh, and as it turns out, we can't. Uh, so here is a long list of CAs that have been compromised. Uh, and so when you compromise a CA, some really bad things happen, and I'll talk about what those bad things are. Um, but does anyone really kn know how many, uh, how many CAs we actually trust in our browser? Has anyone looked at the list of CAs and seen the number? How many? About how many? I got tired of scrolling. Okay. Get tired of scrolling is a good enough qualitative measure. Yeah, well, this name should be interesting to you because it's um, it's a name that we all know to trust, right? So yeah, we are we are trusting some some things that that uh, implicitly, right? Oh, well, you you can explicitly delete the ones that you don't trust, but this is a problem because now our if you think about attack surface, so in security you want to minimize your attack surface. Uh, in, when it comes to certificate authorities, we have thousands of certificate authorities. That seems like a huge attack surface. Because if you get, get into one of these certificate authorities, all of a sudden you can, you can start issuing certificates that are not, that, are not legitimate, but appear to be legitimate. OK, so what can you do if you compromise a certificate authority, including its private key? Um, example number one, so uh, the Iranian government did this in uh, 2011. Uh, they compromised DigiNotar, and then um, starts, they started minting certificates to impersonate uh, all the different sites that its uh, activists were visiting. And then in this way, they could perform a man-in-the-middle attack, where you can pretend to be the legitimate site and then proxy requests to that legitimate site against people you're trying to surveil. So that's, that's the big issue. Um, Another example was uh, uh, WoSign uh, was automatically issuing certs via GitHub repos on subdomains that it didn't, it, it didn't really want to, I guess is what I should say. Uh, and so uh, that was being abused. Uh, so when you uh, compromise a certificate authority, uh, it basically allows you to do a man-in-the-middle attack. And so this is what the attack looks like. Um, you have the original bank that has a legitimate certificate uh, on the right. And then in the middle, you have the attacker. Uh, and the attacker has compromised the certificate authority and has issued him, him or herself 
a, a bogus certificate in blue in the middle. And then what happens? Uh, it does a man, uh, the attacker launches a man in the middle attack, hijacks the connection uh, of, the, of the customer on the left. So it's trying to go to httpsbank.com. Uh, uh, and then it just takes the client hello of the protocol, forwards that on. Uh, when the server sends back the certificate, the attacker can turn around and inject the bogus certificate. And because the bogus certificate has the signature of a valid CA, uh, the, we'll say since it's female on the left, we'll say Alice, will, Alice's browser will validate that that signature is valid and then accept this certificate as uh, bank.com. Okay. Uh, and then the key exchange is done. And then uh, the key exchange from, from Alice to the attacker is done. And then the attacker back to the bank is done as well. And in this way, the data that gets encrypted is decrypted in the middle and re-encrypted so that you end up with a man in the middle uh, attack, which uh, causes the jailbreak. Okay. So in this way, the attacker is proxying data between the user and the bank, sees all the traffic going through it, and can modify the traffic at will. Um, so this was revealed as something that was being done by the GCHQ, which is the equivalent of the NSA in, in, in Britain. This was being done that Edward Snowden revealed. And this is what made a lot of people really mad, uh, that they were hijacking these uh, TLS connections in order to do this operation. Okay. okay, so there are potential solutions to this if this happens. Uh, the, the slow solution is to convince Chrome or Firefox or any of the browsers to get rid of those uh, uh, keys in the browser and in, on the server. Um, another thing that they have proposed, and this is only partially deployed, is something called uh, public key pinning. Uh, and the idea here is that you associate a site certificate to a specific authority. So for Google, Google has their specific authority that assigns most of their certificates. What they'll do is they'll advertise that the only authority who is legitimately able to sign my certificates is this one. Okay, um, And so you, um, the, the idea here is that on the very first request for you to get a certificate for Google.com, uh, you will associate the uh, authority that signed that certificate as the one that should always sign Google certificates. So this is, the idea here is a trust on first use. As soon as I get that first one and I see the signature, I am going to assume that that authority should never change. And that's what this uh, uh, public key pinning uh, idea is doing. Okay, and then on subsequent requests, if somebody has managed to issue a rogue Google.com cert, your browser will be like, no, I know what a legit cert looks like. Um, the other thing that's being done is what's known as certificate transparency. Um, and so uh, the goal is for every single CA to publicly announce all of the certificates that it has generated. And in this way, if you're Google.com and you're scanning this log of certificates being generated and all of a sudden you see DigitNotar has generated a cert for you, You'll be like, okay, uh, we got to do something about DigiNotar. And then what happens is that clients, when they access, when they, when they get certificates from sites, they can go and look at this transparency log to make sure that, yeah, this is something that hasn't been issued yesterday. That's part of a phishing attack. This certificate has been issued. And not only that, the certificate authority that issued it has been issuing the same thing, the same certificate to Google.com or has been the issuer for Google.com certificates over and over again. And that will, this transparency log will then allow you to trust that certificate you're getting behaviorally, uh, uh, rather than just digital uh, uh, encryption wise. Okay, um, this is one of the things that they've talked about putting on the blockchain, right? Uh, immutable ledger. Uh, I put all of this, the logs of people signing certificates onto an immutable ledger, and then people can query it to see uh, what's going on. Okay, so yeah, a lot of this, uh, in fact, uh, I, I bet you there is a blockchain service advertising that. I just don't have it in my slides. Yep. Uh, 
Um, typically, apps are making web requests on the back end. Uh, so spoofing the app and then spoofing those requests, yeah. So I, I would say, in fact, that might be a harder problem to secure because now you also have the installation of the app that could be hijacked, not just the requests. Um, and people reverse engineering the app to, to pull off the request, I don't know. It doesn't seem as... It, it seems to add more, uh, uh, more issues than it solves, but you, you might be able to design something uh, that uses an app that's more secure. I would have to think about that, but offhand I would say maybe not. Um, okay, so that was a roundabout way to get, to, uh, get back to sensitive data exposure, but I want you to digest all of that. Uh, so I'm gonna take a five minute break and then I'm gonna talk about uh, sensitive data exposure. Okay, um, which is sad, but I don't have a T-Rex not to try to do that, right? Off the bat. So uh, that was a roundabout way to get to sensitive data exposure. Uh, and uh, that is what, oops, turn this on. That is what your, um, uh, this next, there's very, there's only one lesson in this thing because uh, the thing with sensitive data exposure, aside from the protocol stuff, the encryption stuff, I didn't want to like do too much in terms of overlap with CS485. I know some of you are taking CS485. It's done in that course. So if you're really interested in the encryption and breaking the encryption, I would suggest that course. Um, but the idea of sensitive data exposure is that uh, for either data is stored insecurely or transmitted insecurely. Um, your application fails to, pr to protect the data in all of the places that it's located. Um, so, and the, the data could be a, a vast wealth of information, right? Like when you are auditing your site, uh, you have to think about usernames, passwords, hashes, credit cards, uh, any kind of address information. Uh, underneath, you have to think about session IDs, uh, tokens, uh, any keys that your site might have. There is a ton of stuff, a ton of information to protect. So simply auditing that is like a full-time job in some places because there's so much information there. Uh, but it's really important. You have to enumerate everything that you have that is sensitive in order for you to be able to protect it, right? And this is where a lot of companies, they don't even have an inventory. And that's why they're, they're, they're so hosed. Um, so everywhere where all this information is stored and everywhere where this information is transmitted, you have to think about making sure uh, it's all secure. Um, and so you'll see stuff like this. You'll ha have people, developers, leaving artifacts in source code. Uh, so uh, for example, functionality that's in comments in the HTML files, uh, API keys that are in comments in uh, source files that end up in Git. Uh, so uh, this was this was the example I used in the first class from from last month, um, and so how bad can it get? This was a paper from uh, uh, earlier last year. Uh, somebody built a system. It was on Google Cloud, as you can see over here. Google Cloud pulls the GitHub dataset, uh, and then what what these folks did was they they uh, sat there and they wrote a monitor uh, for all the commits. And they monitored all the commits to see whether or not anything that looked like an API key showed up in a commit. And then they immediately, uh, well, grabbed it. And so uh, the, the statistics on how quickly they can find an uploaded API key was like 20 seconds, median time to discovery of when you do a git push that accidentally has your API key in it. So don't fool anybody, if you do the push, and you go there and you delete the key and, and, and try and delete the, the Git entry, it's already gone. And that's what this paper, if you wanna, if you're really interested in this, uh, go ahead and read that paper uh, to, uh, to find. And these are the things that it was looking for, right? And so if a good guy can build this system, you can bet your you know, you know, money that an adversary has, has gone and done this work, yeah. 
You have to rotate, you need to, so the other thing is you need a process for rotating your keys and for invalidating your keys very quickly. So you have to think about that. When you build your site, you have to think about what are, like, do I have a Python script that can go and reset all of my keys in all the places that they need to be reset? Because you're gonna need that eventually. Um, and most, if you uh, start using the cloud a lot, there are these key management services that the cloud providers have, like a AWS, it's, I think it's called KMS, they have this, this thing called KMS, where they will go and they'll rotate them, or well, they'll help you rotate them uh, automatically. And you can see similar things done on Google Cloud, but uh, we'll, get to, we'll get more towards that in, in the last part of this course. Um, another really interesting one, this is sort of funny, this is from last year also, uh, debug code that was left functional. And so uh, JWT, which we'll talk about uh, in a couple weeks, this is a way of authorizing requests across different domains. So for example, you log in through Google, you log in with Google, and then uh, Google might say, oh, here's a, here's a token that you can present to this other site for them to know that you have authenticated with me. So it's like social sign-on. So this is done with bearer tokens. And so uh, Auth0 is an authentication company that's helping provide this. And uh, they had in their system some debug code. And if you look closely at this debug code, uh, they left this in debug mode and it said, oh, it says uh, invalid signature expected this value and got this value. So yeah, that ended up uh, not being very, uh, not a very good look for an authentication company. Um, so yeah, that's another thing. Um, insecure storage, this happens a lot where the victim, here's a scenario, the victim enters a credit card number in a form, um, the credit card gets declined or, some, or refused, and then uh, the error message, because you got an error from the credit card company, gets logged into log files, and this is in the clear. And then if the attacker has somehow compromised the cloud project and has been given read access to the log files or has obtained read access to the logging service on that cloud project, then you can basically pull out all the, all the credit card numbers uh, that have been authorized. Uh, so this happened to Monzo, this mobile only bank in August. Uh, so the pins, so the credit card pins were being stored or were not being stored, but they were being logged the actual pins in the clear were being logged to a log file, um, internal log files. Uh, GitHub was doing this, this is two years ago, uh, for the passwords. Uh, it was logging plain text passwords in the clear to a log file uh, on their site. Uh, Instagram did this last year. Uh, millions of passwords in plain text in internal server logs. Now you would have to assume, like so, <laughs> If they're in the logs, you have to assume that people have read them. Otherwise, you're making the assumption that no one has hacked you, which is not a really good assumption for most companies to make these days. Um, so then this would require you to, because they're in the clear and their passwords, you would force a reset for all of your users uh, in that case. Uh, and then Twitter uh, uh, admitted to uh, 300 million of these things in plain text. I don't think this was a log file. Oh, no, it was an internal log file. Okay. Um, another problem is insecure transport, and this is why I had to go through t <laughs> TLS and SSL. Um, so the idea here is that uh, you can, if either of these connections from the victim to the front end, or from the front end to the back end, or from the back end to other business partners' back end, if any of those things are not using SSL or TLS, then you've got, a, 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 you've got that data in clear text, in plain text. So that's what uh, this particular one is talking about. Um, this is the target breach. So with the target breach, a third party contractor got onto their internal network. And because uh, their, their sort of point, point of sale system, talking to their backend database, was not using encryption properly, they were able to pull out uh, uh, all the credit card information. And this cost uh, Target uh, a quarter of a billion dollars in liability uh, for that one. Okay, uh, here's my favorite one. This is from the blockchain class, but this is uh, cryptocurrencies are all the rage. 
Uh, as it turns out, there is this site, this piece of software that was taking, so if you, if you know how private keys are stored uh, for your wallets, it's these passphrases. It's like a collection of 20 words. This particular thing was actually sending those to the Google spell checker. Uh, and then you could hijack the key by looking at the words that were being sent uh, to the spell checker uh, in, this, in this session. And this is what this person uh, does. This is a, a dump in the bottom right, and then you can see the, the words that are being checked, which are basically, if you recover that, you have the person's wallet, their, their cryptocurrency wallet. Uh, PayPal, so this just happened. Uh, we're going to talk, so they use two things for this one. They use this cross-site scripting, uh, cross-site script include, which I'm not, uh, you, you won't know uh, until like three weeks from now we'll cover that. Uh, but the thing is, is they use that to submit a bunch of CAPTCHAs as the victim. So uh, CAPTCHAs are ways of re-authenticating you to make sure that you're a human so that you're not brute forcing someone's password. So what they did was they uh, used XX, XSSI to create requests from the victim over and over against the login uh, system. And that forced the user into this workflow that included reCAPTCHA, which is Google's way of validating that you're human. And as it turns out, the reCAPTCHA workflow uh, had in its workflow a self-submitting form with the data provided, including the login request, the email address, and the te text password all in the clear. And so that's what this uh, PayPal excellent, this, this uh, got this guy 25,000, I think, as a bounty. So this was, just, this was actually just last week. Um, and then this is the screenshot. Uh, it's blown up here on the bottom where you can actually see the, the login password. You can't see the login email. You see the results of that is sent in the, uh, in, in the clear, okay? Rather than um, hidden. Okay, uh, another problem is broken cryptography. Uh, so if you are deploying systems that use cryptography, you have to know which cryptographic algorithms are broken, right? And for sure, Base64, that's not even a cryptography speed. In fact, I shouldn't have put that in there saying it is crypto. This is your homework. There's only one homework for, for this thing, and it's to decode Base64 and show you that that's not encryption. Um, so, uh, but things like MD5, so in 2005, uh, these researchers showed that these two uh, MD5 hashes, uh, and, or no, these two payloads will give you the exact same MD5 hash. So this allow this gets rid of the non-repudiation piece of, of the, uh, if you remember the digital signatures, hashes are being used uh, to sort of like get a message integrity check on the document you want uh, sort of signed, and then that's signed. So this immediately blows up the integrity check by allowing this collision. Uh, so you should, and you see most people don't use MD5 anymore, but if you do see it, uh, you should make sure that you're not, uh, uh, that you're getting, you're working to get rid of it. Um, and so these things, you can get collisions for less than a dollar. Well, this was in 2014. You could do this for less than a dollar. It's probably way easier now than uh, that. Um, here's another one. This is AES ECB mode. Uh, and so this is where you would want to make sure you're using cipher block chaining. And then this is a, this is a, a topic in 485 and 585. So you can clearly see this is the Linux Penguin encrypted with ECB. The problem is with most of these uh, block ciphers is if you have a certain plain text, it will always emit the same cipher text out. And so if you have an image with a whole bunch of plain text that looks the same, you'll get a whole bunch of ciphertext that looks the same. And that's what ECB mode is versus CVC mode, where you're chaining the output. The, the output of the previous block you encrypted is chained into the input of the next block that you encrypt, uh, is this one. Uh, another uh, topical exploit is uh, this Poodle attack. This is a downgrade attack. There are many known insecure versions of TLS and SSL. And so this particular one, uh, if you allow on your server to fall back to a legacy protocol like SSL 3.0, you can get hijacked. So this is something on the configuration you would want to deny, right? Like don't allow the downgrade anymore. Uh, so this is uh, very well taken care of, but you, you never know for subsequent protocols that have been broken. You have to be aware of which ones are, are, are working and which ones uh, no longer do. Um, this just happened. 
Last week also, SHA-1 is now officially broken. So the problem with SHA-1 is that it's, it's in a lot of places still. Um, we've been telling people not to use it for a couple decades, uh, but now it's fully broken. Uh, and so that's what um, this one, I think this, if you actually, the, the links are here. So if you actually go to any of these things and, uh, and go to these links, uh, you can click on the actual uh, paper that says that it's a shambles. And then this thing, I think the proof of concept is now like a $65,000 exploit to get two SHA-1 things uh, to collide is the, is the cost. Um, and so this, they say this is using GitHub still. So a lot of the Git uh, uh, repo stuff is using SHA-1. And then uh, there was another place that used it that I forget. But yeah, the links are there if you want to read about that. Um, another thing is poorly used cryptography. <laughs> People not understanding the cryptography, which I would be one of them. Like, I, I wouldn't want to be uh, doing any of this stuff uh, for a fact. But people using these things in ways that they're not supposed to be using them. Um, so, for example, using a pseudo-random number generator, but then using it with a predictable seed. A seed that can be easily reverse engineered versus something that's truly random that can't be predicted. Uh, it turns out with these pseudo-random number generators, which are used in things like stream ciphers, uh, if you can predict the seed, you have a full jailbreak on your on your stream cipher. Um, using cryptographic hashes without a salt, we'll get this when we talk about password storage. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it here. Uh, and then guessable two two factor pin codes or guessable password resets. So if you are uh, deterministically generating these things in a way that you can predict, uh, the adversary can just uh, go and exploit you directly. Uh, and then this last one is um, any homegrown algorithm is almost guaranteed to be uh, vulnerable. So uh, the, the moral of this story um, is to never grow your own crypto, to always use uh, someone else's impl vetted implementations is what uh, this particular one uh, talks about. And then finally, this was from yesterday, uh, buggy implementations. So as it turns out, uh, Crypt32 DLL on Windows uh, for their elliptic curve uh, public crypto scheme. Uh, it was validating three parameters, but not the fourth in ECC. And so this allows, this was what this urgent update was on Tuesday. Uh, so yesterday, some uh, creative uh, security researcher uh, minted an NSA cert uh, using an ECC algorithm, a legitimate NSA cert, and then uh, hosted a site that rickrolled people. So, uh, and then he did this, I think he did this for GitHub as well. Uh, so if you are using a, a crypto scheme that's got a bug in it, you gotta patch that quickly. And so hopefully everyone has patched this one. Uh, I know I actually, this is, I usually ignore whether or not my patch level is, is, is that up to date. I actually checked on mine and I manually installed this patch uh, just because, yeah, that's probably not good. Uh, okay, so prevention, and this is a lot of this stuff we've kind of covered already, but this is just a checklist of things that you should make sure you do when you're auditing your web, web application or your website. Uh, first, in security, you have to um, define your threat model. Like, what are the threats that you're trying to prevent? And then focus your energy on preventing that threat model. Um, a lot of times, people don't have a direction in terms of what they're trying to secure, and they end up securing something that shouldn't be in your threat model, or is like so randomly rare that it shouldn't be there. So uh, this means uh, accounting for, for the attacks that you really want to focus on. Uh, the next thing is encrypt everything, so at rest and in flight. And one of the things with cloud providers is that they're really good about encrypting everything. So if you have developed an app in the cloud, uh, not only in, uh, in storage, in a, for example, a storage bucket, at rest it's encrypted. When you're making API calls to the like, backend databases, the gRPC on the backend, that's automatically encrypted. So a lot of the stuff in the backend cloud uh, infrastructure is encrypted. Uh, but the front end is your responsibility. Like the app that is actually running on the cloud, pro uh, cloud provider's uh, infrastructure, that's your responsibility. So things like making sure your site has HTTPS would be something that you would want to um, um, validate. Uh, enabling transport security. Uh, and so we talked about strict, strict transport security. 
vanishingly few uh, sites, well, this is 2016, so maybe more people have, have done it. Um, about 25% of sites use strict transport security. Um, and apparently, some didn't have a good time with it because it decreased from mid-year to the end of year there. Um, uh, uh, the, the other things are to employ certificate and public key pinning if you think you want to protect against rogue certificate authorities. And then obviously disable all the broken versions of crypto algorithms uh, that have been deprecated. Uh, in terms of your code, uh, auditing all of your application and logging code to make sure sensitive data doesn't go through there. And as CS uh, students, because you would know the code, that would be something that you can uniquely provide. Uh, and this is where, when they talk about DevSecOps, uh, that's where, uh, the, if you know both parts of it, you can be of value, so of real value uh, in industry. Um, there are some tools, so Git filter branch is a built-in tool in Git. Uh, uh, BFG repo cleaner is another one that looks for these keys. Um, one of the interesting things is that almost all cloud projects, AWS and Google, are sitting there scanning the internet all the time for keys that they know users have issued. So Google has, Google has a library of all the API keys and all of the uh, access keys that uh, people have generated. What they'll do, and I know this because they, they found mine on the internet. Ours was intentional, though. Uh, but like, as soon as they find it in, in any of the documents that they pull publicly and it matches against a valid key that has been issued, they will let your project know that that key has been exposed on the internet. Um, so uh, so that, that's progress. Um, the other thing is to look through all your error messages and log files uh, just to make sure nothing uh, shows up in either of those two things. Um, uh, using the algorithms appropriately. So again, standard strong algorithms rather than rolling your own. And then these are all the things in your crypto algorithm you have to think about. The keys, the certificates, the passwords. Making sure they're all securely generated, they're securely distributed and stored. Uh, all of these things are things that you should look for. Okay, so I'm gonna end by going through quickly the labs and the homework. Uh, Port Swigger, the SSRF labs, so the first four uh, labs. Uh, you'll see the basic one that hits a local server. Uh, you'll see another basic one where you don't know the backend system that you're trying to hit. So this is an enumeration, this is basically a port scan. Uh, through the vulnerable server to the backend private network. Here is an example of a Python script that hits that vulnerable server and probes a specific IP address on the backend. What I would prefer that you do is to turn this into a loop and then point it to a whole bunch of IP addresses and then emit the answer. Um, that's actually your easy, I mean, you could manually do it, but like we're, we're CS students, so yeah, it should bother you to have to go, you know, back, back, backspace, backspace 12, backspace, backspace 13. That should just hurt you as a CS student, so please, please use this. Um, and then there's uh, one where you're bypassing an input filter. That's pretty easy to do. This is the double URL decode thing that I uh, mentioned uh, much earlier in the web programming uh, section. Uh, then the XXE labs, so uh, using these things to get Etsy password is the first one. Uh, to perform uh, an SSRF is the next one, and then there's, there's one. One interesting thing is that this uh, scalable vector graphics format is actually XML, and this is an image file format uh, that is everywhere. So you could do an XXE using an SVG file, so that's the, that's the last one. Um, and it's a very simple, uh, they give you the XML, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's not going to take that long. And then uh, there's only one, uh, the insecure cryptographic storage lesson. Um, I would, if you love breaking crypto, um, besides doing the 485, 585 class, I would recommend that, uh, that CTF uh, there, Crypto Pals, which is something that we've, uh, which is designed really well. Okay, so with that, there's not much time for uh, lab work. Uh, but I'm going to end there. Are there any questions? Yes. Sure.